Good morning. I'm going to try my hand at this deep dive uh, because there's a story that really affected me because it took place not too far from me. And the only face of a serial killer a lot of us have in Milwaukee is Jeffrey Dahmer. But I'm here to tell you about another serial killer who did a lot of damage to a lot of young girls. By the, his name is Walter E. Ellis. And he escaped detention for more than 20 years. Um, around here, killing people. Uh, in fact, well, I'm going to get into it. In 1995, the body of a teenage runaway named Jessica Payne was found under a mattress on Milwaukee's north side. Her throat was slashed and she had been only partially clothed. The medical examiner collected the semen from the body. But now back then, DNA testing wasn't as advanced as it is today. So remember that. The sample neither confirmed nor excluded Shante Ott, uh, the man ultimately convicted of killing pain. In 2002, the Wisconsin Innocence Project, and these are the same guys that are working on the Avery and Dassey, Dasser uh, case, that, so, that same project, um, it's like a, you know, the innocent, this is what it's called, Innocence Project. They're trying to get out, out of prison and ask for more testing. This time, I was excluded. Now, even though he was excluded, he remained in prison. So, five years later, Milwaukee County District Attorney Mark Williams called Innocent Project Attorney John Prey. The DNA, Williams told him, had been linked to two other dead women. So now, the search for a killer, in fact, a serial killer, was on. It wasn't the first time that authorities suspected a predator was stalking women on Milwaukee's north side. But, if what authorities believe is true, then Walter E. Ellis escaped detection for more than 20 years. The politics of the criminal justice system, a host of unreliable witnesses, and the fact that most of the victims were prostitutes, helped him avoid arrest even as the bodies were dumped within blocks from his home. Okay, it's like another Jeffrey Dahmer situation. Now, Ellis was charged last week with killing seven women. His DNA, authorities say, was found on two more. And they're not done looking. Scientists at the state crime laboratory are testing genetic materials found on the victims of another 20 unsolved homicides. The first to die was Deborah Harris. Tanya Miller. Deborah Harris was 31 and then you had Tanya Miller. She was 19. Harris was found in the Menominee River. On October 10th, 1986, Miller was found the next day between a house garage in the 2100 block of 28th Street. Both had been strangled. Bill Vogel, who also worked on the Jeffrey Dahmer case, um, who led Milwaukee Police Department Homicide Unit at the time, suspected a serial killer almost immediately after Miller's body was discovered. Vogel, who retired in 1991, said he told his supervisors that he thought the same person had killed the two women. Um, now, I entered with a business-like attitude to discuss the matter. I used the word serial and I got reamed out, Vogel said. And I'm pretty sure Vogel is an uh, officer, again, that worked on Jeffrey Dahmer's case. 
or was in that it was either Jeffrey Dahmer or um, Frank Jude. That was the end of the meeting. I think they were more fearful of the pressure. He said, when I used the word cereal, I got reamed a new a-hole. Y'all get it. And they just ended the meeting. I think they were more fearful of the pressure that it would create in the media than anything else. They didn't want the word used. They didn't want it to get out to the media. This is how they do us as the people because they said we're going to panic so they don't tell us anything. And people disappearing left and right. Um, Nick Sandoval, a detective who worked under Vogel, said the homicide unit was understaffed and detectives were often overwhelmed by the number of killings that they were investigating. There were 85 homicides that year. That's all? We were so shorthanded. Homicides uh, would come in and we would start on one and we never really got our teeth into them to the point where we could do a follow, a, you know, a decent follow up. We would come in the next morning and lo and behold, we would have another one. It was like a vicious circle. The two cases went unsolved. The talk of a serial killer just died now. Okay, so it just died down. Nobody talked about a serial killer anymore. Then, in the early 1990s, another strange coincidence occurred. In November 1992, the body of Irene Smith, 25, was found in a trash cart in the alley behind the 300 block of North 6th Street. Two years later, 32-year-old Karen Kilpatrick's body was found in another trash cart in the same alley. As it turns out, the alley runs behind the house where Ellis lived with his mother just a few blocks away. But police didn't know that at the time. And let me tell you, um, let me just make this comment. And I know this might sound cold to a lot of y'all. Um, if I got a grown son and he's not doing nothing but running up and down the streets and I don't know, I can't even give an account to where he spends his time. He don't have a job. He don't have anything. He can't stay with me. See, if he's a man and if he don't know how to be one, well, then I'm going to have to be like the bird and push him out the uh, nest because he's going to have to find out how. Definitely he's going to have to. Him more so before my daughters. Because that's a bum dude. And nobody wants to. Because this is the kind of stuff that an idle mind is the devil worship. And see this is the kind of stuff that it lead to when you let a, a bum. And I ain't trying to be funny. A dude that don't want nothing but to lay on you. Eat your groceries. Spend your food. Beg you for money. Smoke weed in your house. Or do drugs in your house. And you as a mother is allowing him to do that. I hold you more uh, just as accountable as I hold him. So this guy was killing people right down the street from his mother. From his mother's house. Okay. So Smith's case was added to the city's list of unsolved homicides. In Kilpatrick's case, however, the police found a viable suspect. Her live-in boyfriend, Curtis McCoy, with two witnesses and a confession, prosecutors charged McCoy with killing Kilpatrick, the mother of five. <coughs> now, his parents owned uh, McCoy's Cakes and Pies, which was a big... Uh, pie place here and I think he was responsible actually for him for them actually having to close their business uh because of the embarrassment because of the um you know the money I guess they had to spend out with this guy um anyway there was an overwhelming mountain of evidence against him recall McCoy's defense attorney Michael Chernum 
A young man who was living with the couple, a surrogate son of sorts to McCoy, told police that he heard McCoy and Kilpatrick arguing. The man said he watched from an upstairs window as McCoy dragged Kilpatrick's body down the back stairs and into his van. Now let me say this. This person, Kilpatrick, was a friend of my sister. My foster sister, adopted sister, she knew her very well. And so when she was placed in the, uh, well, let me finish reading the story, and then I'm, I'm going to go on from here. Um, there was a guy, again, who said he watched him, uh, McCoy, drag Kilpatrick's body down the back stairs and into a van. Kilpatrick's five-year-old daughter also testified against McCoy. She said she had seen McCoy choke her mother and then drag her body out the front door. Um, armed with those accounts. Now, he lived around the corner from me. And that's, uh, they uh, put the body in a, and he had a real long driveway. And they put the body in, I guess, and they dumped her out somewhere. Okay? Um, armed with those accounts, the detectives interviewed McCoy. Churin characterized the detectives, both now retired, as two of the most honest and straightforward detectives he has ever encountered. They really connected with Curtis. And Curtis was so distraught at the time, they, they more or less con convinced uh, him through just talk therapy that maybe he was temporarily insane at the time. Now, although McCoy told police he did not remember the details and said he choked Kilpatrick only to the point uh, of unconsciousness. Now, re let's listen to this. Although McCoy told the police he did not remember the details and said he choked Kilpatrick only to the point of unconsciousness, the f confession was good enough to be used against him at the trial. So preparing for court, Chernin's investigators found eight unsolved homicides that they believe were similar to Kilpatrick's. But the Milwaukee County Circuit Judge Stanley Miller, who I'm glad he's gone, um, all these players I, I, I'm familiar with, okay, and they were pieces of crap, and I'm kind of glad that they're gone because uh, Stanley Miller was... Uh, someone who was married to a woman who was so crazy that ran a lot of properties here uh, that it, she was just crazy. Tommy, I know if you listen to this um, uh, uh, podcast, you probably remember the woman's name that was your landlord over there on 79th Street. One of the investigators, Dale Wiggins, also was dismayed by the decision that he wrote a letter to the judge. And um, he said to properly pursue an investigation that may yield a serial killer, some basic details must be known. Not only could the information from the other investigations exculpate Mr. McCoy, it could assist in other solving cases. The police admittedly do not have the time nor the resources to actively punish and pursue such cases. The police had told him that they were too busy to compare physical evidence from many crime scenes, Wiggins wrote. Miller, now deceased, did not change his mind. Even so, a jury found McCoy not guilty. Now, at the time, Chernin said that there was public outcry and people complained McCoy had gotten off on a technicality. So by 1990, about 1997, he just moved out and moved to Mississippi. Now, when I saw him, I saw him in the uh, pick and save, the grocery store. And he's looking at me and he's going, yeah, I know you think, um, because remember, this guy lived around the corner from me. He was like, yeah, I know you think that I killed uh, um, 
uh, uh, whatever her name was. I can't even remember at this time. But I didn't do anything. And they had me in jail for no reason. And uh, I don't know why they, they, they put me in jail. I was just very uncomfortable even having a conversation with them because I said to myself, dude, you, 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 you're nuts. And my sister already told me that the chick that was staying with you, you was beating her up anyway. Okay. So they were all into drug use and there was a lot of things that was happening. Um, and at that time that was going on in McCoy's house. Anyway, to make a long story short, again, he just moved to Mississippi, okay? He he wanted to get up out of it, so that's where he's at now. He's just in Mississippi. So, another suspect was tried. Ellis, though, was still in Milwaukee. And in June of that year, the body of Joyce Mims was found in a vacant home in a 2900 block of North 5th Street. Police suspected George L. Mule Jones, then 52, um, Jones had served time for manslaughter and he would eventually confess to strangling 24-year-old Shamika Carter. He had been friends with Mims for years. Jones and Mims used to party together back in their hometown of Cleveland, Mississippi and had an on-again, off-again romantic relationship. And although Mim sometimes traded sex for drugs, she was very cautious, friends said, and rarely went off with men she didn't know. Okay, like I said, they were all using drugs then, including my sister, who is, in the, is deceased now as well. Jones took a lie detector test, and he denied killing Mims. He also said he had never put a woman's dead body in a garbage cart. But the polygraph examiner found his answers to be deceptive. Jones also had a connection with Sheila Farrier, 37, who was found strangled in a vacant house in 1995. Along with Jones and Mims, Farrier had spent time at the Friendship Club, a hangout for recovering um, alcoholics. And if anybody out here from Milwaukee is listening to this uh, podcast, um, if y'all was a member of the Friendship Club or been to, I, I mean, I knew people that were there all the time. In fact, I had a friend who was a recovering alcoholic, or, um, and I, I call them, uh, you know, just people that hung out to stay sober. And they would hang out at this place called the Friendship Club. Now... Investigators compared Jones's DNA with evidence found on eight dead women. It matched only in the case of Carter, the woman he admitted to killing. So, see, they still had a problem on their hands. Okay? Investigators did not back then compare DNA found on Mims with the other genetic material found on Farrier. When they finally did so, years later, it matched. Both are now believed to be among the victims of Ellis. So then they created a task force. After Jones' arrest, police convened a task force to investigate the unsolved murders of women. Initially, 44 officers were assigned to the task force full-time. And after about a year... It included seven full-time and six part-time officers. Ellis's name surfaced during that time, but he was just one of many suspects, according to former Milwaukee police detective Stephen Spinola, who personally investigated several of the cases now linked to Ellis. Ellis's name popped up because he lived in a neighborhood where some of the bodies were left, Spinola said. You can't believe how many people were interviewed in those cases. There were thousands of names. So the detectives pieced together the hours, the days, the weeks surrounding the death of each victim, looking for any commonalities that they could find. But with prostitutes, that was difficult. In many cases, the victim families had not seen them for weeks. And in one case, 
the victim had missed her own daughter's second birthday. The guys they hung around with were your worst nightmare, says Spinola, who teaches criminal justice now at Marquette University and works as a consultant. When you try to put where they were and who they were with, it's very difficult. And when those trails go cold, it's awfully hard to pick them back up because they just go cold. Spinola said he isn't surprised Ellis lived in an area where many of the bodies were dumped. Several of them was dumped in empty buildings. How else would you know it was vacant? He knows the neighborhood. He knows the haunts. He could have just waved and nod and get down the street and get out of there, right? This is the description of a true serial killer. Ellis had not been charged with killing Payne or Kilpatrick. Prosecutors do not have enough evidence to meet their burden of proof in those cases, according to Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. McCoy, in poor health, supports himself on a small military pension. Even though he was acquitted of killing Kilpatrick, Chernin said McCoy lost everything. His children were removed from his care, his house was vandalized, his vehicle was towed, and never returned. Ott was released from prison in January after serving 13 years in the murder of pain. He recently filed a lawsuit against the city two former police chiefs, and several of the detectives. Prey said he is proud the Innocent Project's scrutiny of the Ott case may have played a part in catching the serial killer. I'm happy if part of what we did was to get this guy off of the streets. That's what Prey said. Vogel the retired homicide detective said he expects the DNA tests still underway at the crime lab to link Ellis to more murders of prostitutes. It wouldn't surprise me at all, he said. These types of people have something obviously wrong with inside their minds. You understand that? Listen to y'all. These types of people have something obviously wrong inside their mind. And they all inside the community. Full of drugs and alcohol. Praying. Praying on women. Especially because they see us as the weaker sex, of course. And they know just who to mess with. Right? These are women that are on the left foot, as my mama would say, or Miss Grant would say. On the left foot. I don't know what gratification they get from doing it, but they don't stop. And this is the description of a true serial killer. Now, Ellis was also an informant for the police. So not only was he out here killing people, they actually used him as an informant. So they was paying him, and he out here... Doing this type of nefarious stuff. This article was done by Gina Barton, by the way, of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, this guy was responsible, and they're still pulling bodies out that they think that he's responsible for. So as of now. He is in jail. He hadn't he hasn't slipped through the cracks this time. And they got the wrong one. They got the right one. I'm sorry. They got the right one. I never know if McCoy was let go for killing Kilpatrick, but I believe he did it. And there's nothing and my mind could tell me different. I don't even know, like how his energy felt when I saw him in the store. I was like, uh-uh, buddy, get away from me. This is my deep dive. My very first attempt. And I want y'all to tell me 
what y'all think about this story, how you think I did, um, what I could do better. And um, I look forward to your input. Thank you for listening. And um, I'll see you on the next deep dive.